So thank you, Denver, very much for this uh, warm welcome, and I'm delighted to be to have the possibility to contribute to that great conference. Uh, and I was asked to, if possible, summarize some of the findings into um, an advice or a topic, and I was thought like think global, act global. But after what we have heard already from Minangula, from uh, Jason, and, and all the pilot projects uh, that they presented, I think the act local is uh, ticked off. You are on a good way already. So, uh, congrats for that. I would like to share some thoughts with you today, uh, zooming out on the international market and then zooming in again to Namibia, uh, what that means, uh, and uh, have a look at the large opportunities and also how to go step by step. Because in the international community of uh, all stakeholders, companies, governments, uh, SMEs and startups being involved in this new market, we have seen the last two, three years a discussion about uh, the what, uh, how, how large can this market be, which volumes need to be produced, where could they come from. And now the discussion in the next years, upcoming years, is more about how to implement it, how to do it, and how to uh, get started and how to learn from each other. Uh, so, so that's that's where this uh, um, next minutes are focused on. Why am I talking about hydrogen as a part of Worley? Uh, Worley, we are engineers. We are 51,000 people around the globe, Australian-based company, uh, and we are. Uh, working in 49 countries worldwide uh, with also 3,000 consultants, so engineers and consultants. So we are the ones bringing the plans and the projects onto the road. We are analyzing, we are uh, planning, and we are constructing uh, the projects. And that has evolved, meanwhile, to more than 3,400 projects in the uh, energy transition space, and also more than 200 projects uh, related to hydrogen already. So what we are doing is to get experience with international teams in one country in project A and carry it to the project B in the next country and so on and so on. Because in this phase of the market it is very important that we exchange knowledge openly because everyone is on the learning curve. <coughs> so I would like to share three aspects with you. First one the hydrogen market globally, how is it scaling up? Second part, at the supply, where it's coming from, why is Namibia well positioned in that? And then go to the boost in various uh, projects. When we go back to the original idea of hydrogen, and um, I will not go back to the chemistry in Menagula uh, uh, a bit after that, um, but I also have to have a look on that table again. Uh, the whole idea of hydrogen as an energy carrier is to reach the sectors, the industrial and economic sectors that we cannot reach with uh, electricity, with green electricity. And just an example, in Europe we are proud to have 40% of renewable electricity in the grid system. Um, and this is wind and solar, mainly, but we have taken 20 years to get there. And with hydrogen, we cannot afford to take that long time. So that means that we need to do projects faster in a different way and implement them. Because also the, the size of the market is enormous. So if you look at the right hand side, you see it is about decarbonized transportation. We know that we can equip small cars with uh, electric batteries, but for large vehicles and ships that would not work and uh, the most obvious for airplanes neither. So we need uh, hydrogen as an energy carrier for that. Uh, we need also to decarbonize industrial energy use. Uh, we heard about fertilizer projects, the fertilizer uh, use ammonia. This is produced nowadays uh, uh, with a lot of CO2 emissions that can be replaced, and this is one of the low-hanging fruits. Uh, and one side comment here, when we talk about, or when I talk about hydrogen, I always mean the family of products of hydrogen. So it's not only the pure hydrogen, that we know is, is sometimes hard to store, uh, but it's also the derivatives of it. This is green ammonia that can be transferred to fuels in the future. So that will be a broad range that is needed to supply all these industries with it. 
And to get an idea of the size, if we take the transportation fleet, and just one calculation example, I'm coming from Germany, I flew in from Berlin uh, yesterday. So if, if we want to replace all the heavy truck fleet, only the heavy trucks, not cars, uh, not small cars, not buses, not, not other chemical industries or other industries, and we would supply them with the needed hydrogen uh, volumes, we would need to ramp up the hydrogen that is available today in the country by a factor of 110. So one, more than 100 times more hydrogen is needed than we have. And if we do the same for the building sector, for heating purposes, for example, the factor is 830. So you can imagine, this is not, not a ramp up of the market that is enlarging, it's a totally new magnitude of market that we talk about. And this is underpinned by the plans that also go looking at Europe for the European Union. Um, you see the countries uh, listed here, and there is a high demand that has been even accelerated um, by this horrible invasion of uh, Russia and Ukraine, which has put another shortage on gas and other uh, fuels and, and uh, rising prices. So the Repower EU plan um, encounters 10 million tons of domestic production of hydrogen plus 10 million tons of imports. And these 10 million tons of imports, they need to come from somewhere. And that is uh, where we want to focus on, on the next part. So what we can see here is a ramp up of the forecasted market volumes from different regions in, uh, in the world. And you can see that um, Africa looks like it would come late, but the effect is that nowadays we have many projects already at a further stage, mainly in Europe, but they are smaller scale. For example, we have one project that Shell has announced to be FID, the financial investment, final investment decision in the port of Rotterdam for 200 megawatt electrolyzer plant using wind electricity. Uh, Burley has done all the engineering up to that point. This is the most advanced project, but it's only 200 megawatts, you could say. But everyone is starting step by step uh, to go into that. We have other projects where we implement, um, where we convert refineries uh, that is the size of 50, 60 megawatt nowadays to use wind energy to produce green hydrogen uh, to replace gray hydrogen, etc., etc. I could list uh, a long, I could make a long list of projects that we have uh, that we're working on, and all these have a common goal to learn step by step and take the learnings into the next phase and then ramp up. Uh, and this also gives a chance for Namibia because seeing all these pilot projects is really um, is an exciting thing and also you can additionally learn from the other projects that are around the world and see how did they do it, what is the next technology coming around and how can we uh, get our share in that and then have a faster ramp up even. And the question is, if we ask where does this hydrogen come from in which countries, this is only continents shown here, it's interesting to have, interesting to have a look at this world map where you have the combined cost of um, green hydrogen combined from wind and solar. And you can see Definitely that Namibia is in a good spot. You see the, the dark red part and also a few other countries. So that gives an explanation why we have to have collaborate between um, Europe, for example, and Namibia and other countries uh, to discuss how to get the production moved on and, and, and raised. And this also uh, shows why we are expecting trading routes over the oceans for hydrogen, and there is a strong link um, where Namibia can export also, using the hydrogen for your own decarbonization, but also have good export product um, and different fuels in that market. And what is interesting for Namibia here is that looking at the cost, and you, I have mentioned that we are in, in many projects um, and planning those, you can see that this is the cost breakdown of, of a typical green hydrogen project, on average, are linked to the electricity. 
to the green electricity, to wind and solar, and to grid and networks. And that tells us uh, that first, this is the biggest um, the biggest roadblock that needs to be uh, removed, or the, the biggest planning part that helps projects to grow. And the other one is that in the future we will see a lot of technical innovation in, in this value chain because it's a very complex uh, value chain starting from uh, solar radiation to, uh, to solar panels, then uh, transport by the grid, then, then store electricity, then produce uh, hydrogen with electrolyzer, store the hydrogen, and then produce ammonia or other uh, years will be dominated by pure hydrogen, by ammonia, or by other fuels, or an equal distribution of that. But that means that concentrating on the um, renewable electricity gives open so many options for development to not only stabilize the first projects that are now uh, <coughs> developed here in the country, but also for the next projects coming and gives some flexibility to feed the green electricity into the own grid to solve some of the energy questions of Namibia itself, but also to have a good starting point when new innovation and uh, other technologies come into play. And the positioning of Namibia is dominated by three major uh, pillars. One, you have excellent solar radiation. That I think you have heard that from others already. You have very good wind conditions, but also good port infrastructure that can be enlarged and used for that. And there is not unlimited number of countries that have that combination worldwide. But all these countries are um, hitting the road to, to find their way and their position in that market. So what is the most important thing for the future is to work on these elements that need to, um, to accomplish um, the whole set. Because project community, investment community, and financing uh, need stable conditions, and also a, a clear framework of your own idea of uh, uh, what you can provide to them. And this is regulatory frameworks to begin with. Um, and that does not mean that you have the final solution in the first project. It is very important to go step by step and allow some piloting also in the project and regulatory frameworks. Because the regulatory framework, my colleague Carrie Ann will talk about that tomorrow, is something that also needs to grow. So you don't need the final solution today for the next 20 years. It's more important that your regulatory framework, how investors can come in, how uh, common assets are there, etc., can also develop over time with the learnings from the first and the second project. The second part is infrastructure. Of course, you're all working on that. Um, this is the linking element between projects and the grid. And I would expect in the future that maybe project number 10 and 11 will not anymore be captive power. That means that they build up their own wind resources, their own solar, and only feed into uh, this project, but that there is a grid connection and that you would also share electricity via the grid. Then, of course, you need a regulation for that and as someone who drives that. And this is also something that can enhance uh, the whole uh, project uh, development, uh, because nowadays uh, we know that we, even with all optimization, we have uh, what we call curtailment. So the solar production and the wind production, uh, is we cannot use 100% of that, because then the storage would be so immense that it would run all the cost. The third part is supply industry, uh, and I'm happy to see all the initiatives that are uh, ongoing here in terms of uh, SMEs and other industries, local industries, uh, because if you imagine, uh, let's imagine just one gigawatt as a, as a normal size that, that is used uh, internationally for a project size. One gigawatt of a project encounters 1.2 million solar panels, and it encounters 80 wind turbines on average. That means 3,000 kilometers of cable, and that means almost 100,000 tons of steel. That needs everything needs to be produced, transported, assembled, connected, and operated at the end of the day. So you need a lot of services, a lot of 
uh, suppliers and also skilled labor, and, and uh, we talked about that uh, with uh, with the uh, Professor Nisha. Uh, that to start now. And if you then think that one project, the large projects take construction time between five and ten years, that means that it also opens opportunities for people to start to be trained and educated and study the topics. And when the first project is um, finished, they always also are finished with their, with their career of study. And last but not least, as we said, train specialist is something that also has to uh, grow over time. In that. So what is, now zooming out, what is the boost and barriers for this market? And this is not only for Namib. What I'm convinced that what we can see is a driver for this market is technology development. This is very exciting and it's also motivating to further work into this because since the community, the world community, let's say, has decided to walk that path and to develop a new fuel that helps to decarbonize. There's a lot of startups being uh, growing and being founded uh, all over the world to improve electrolyzers. We expect that the electrolyzer performance that we see today, today we need like 51 kilowatt hours of electricity to produce uh, one kilogram of hydrogen, that this can be improved by over more than 20% which means in future we will, be, we will need less solar panels for the same amount of hydrogen and less wind turbines or with the same amount of um, renewable electricity you can produce more hydrogen. And there's also innovation along the entire value chain. Uh, early as a company is very active in that we have teams working out uh, digital solutions so that from the very beginning of the project you are faster, modularize this value chain, optimize the planning, and increase um, the, the uh, time and performance of, of the development of these projects extremely. And also a driver for this market is of course the demand for hydrogen, uh, demand from all sectors, uh, and also uh, the supply will be based in future in the northern hemisphere, uh, let's say for, from offshore wind mainly, where there's uh, good wind conditions but uh, very little uh, solar radiation in comparison and uh, combined solar and onshore wind uh, from uh, the world like that we have just seen. And the third element that I would like to mention that is not always mentioned is cooperation. Uh, there we see companies working together that have never worked before together. Uh, joint ventures being, being uh, founded. So we see oil and gas companies working together with wind developers. We see CMB and Old Harbor, this is a, a classical example also. We see ports working with, receiving ports with ports that could uh, supply hydrogen. And this is something that opens new opportunities because everyone working in the sector is, is learning from, from the other party how they do uh, projects and how they do the business. And also, of course, a, a strong backbone to that is the intergovernmental cooperation. Um, but James just mentioned the, and showed the, the uh, great cooperation um, that is here between uh, Germany and Namibia, but also in other areas. We see partnerships between Australia and, and other countries with the Middle East and, and uh, North African region, Namibia, uh, South America, and Chile. All these are seeking for um, collaboration. But this is not a self-fulfilling prophecy, so we have to remove the roadblocks uh, to get it going and growing. So we have regulatory requirements that we need to work on uh, to drive standardization. What is that product? Where, where can we put a stamp on it that this is green hydrogen? Who certifies that? Uh, how, how can I have that, that I can trade the product that every party, the seller and the buyer knows uh, what they deal with. We need also offtake facilitation instruments because nowadays, as we don't have an international hydrogen price yet, uh, projects are um, struggling sometimes with financing, while the financing itself is not it's not a bottleneck. Uh, it is more to get to make money flowing into into projects, and that requires as guarantees or what we call contracts for difference for offtake, so that the projects can make their financial plan. And we also need everything that enables uh, to form a hydrogen price to take. 
Another area of concern is supply chains, supply chains internationally and locally. In the past, we have seen discussions where it was in request for proposals that if you build that project, uh, please investor have a look at the in-country value. And uh, I'm almost, that's my last slide. Uh, uh, that we need more in-country value and what is in for the, for the local community. Nowadays, we see that from, we discuss this from two angles. One is to, to get more economic value inside country, but also to de-risk the supply chain. Because if you have every single part of your, of your construction coming in internationally, you increase your risk of disrupted supply chain, as we know, which is a major risk to work on and also local production can help. Um, to, to deal with that. And last but not least, to work steadily and further on, on circular economy. Um, hydrogen needs a lot of water. There's a lot of water in the world, but not in the right place, I would say. And uh, it's encouraging that the investment cost for the water supply, the desalination for hydrogen, is normally around 1% of the capital expenses. That means it opens opportunities to talk about to produce a bit more water supply that to others. And last but not least, infrastructure and shipping. Uh, we need to discuss shared assets for projects, pipeline and uh, later high voltage lines. Uh, that is some area where we also share our knowledge with. And investment in ports to make them hydrogen ready, also on the receiving end, um, on terminals. And shipping is a, we could build a full conference with only shipping. There's uh, the race is on, on the best technology and which fuel is the best fuel to transport. But summarizing with all that, I would like to convey the message that in Namibia, but also in other countries, what is needed is that governments, developers, investors, everyone, suppliers, engineers, all parts of this game, so to say, need to cooperate to commonly remove the barriers to scale up low carbon hydrogen to meet the high demand that we have worldwide. And only then we have a chance to not only implement good projects and uh, have a good business locally, but also contribute to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Thank you very much.